Hello everyone. In the previous video, I demonstrated how you can deploy Keycloak to production with an Nginx load balancer and HTTPS. However, that deployment was using the default Keycloak caching mechanism, which is an embedded cache. So in this video, I'm going to show you how you can use the client server uh, architecture instead of the embedded architecture for Keycloak caching. Okay, so for this demo, this is what my setup looks like. I have an Nginx proxy, and that Nginx proxy is serving two Keycloak servers. Each server has an embedded InfiniSpan cache, and the cache communicates with the other cache in the other server using JGroups. Now, what I wanted to emphasize here is that the embedded nature makes it such that if you restart this Keycloak server, all of the items in the cache are lost because InfiniSpan is an in-memory cache. So whatever's in the memory here is lost. So if you have users logged in and you restart your key clock server, in this case, then the, when they come back, they'll have to re-log in to the app. So that's the downside of the Infinis, uh, having the embedded uh, cache in your server. It is tightly coupled with the actual key clock server. So this is the architecture we're trying to achieve in this demo. It looks somewhat similar to the previous embedded architecture, but there are a few differences. So here we have an Nginx reverse proxy, just like in the previous architecture. We have the two key clock server nodes, but here, if you notice, we have separated the remote cache from the local cache. So now the remote caches are running in their own JVM, meaning that if I restart this key clock server, it's not going to affect Anything that's cached in this remote cache is not going to be affected. So if I'm logged in, I can restart this server. And when the user refreshes the page, they'll still be able to access the page without logging in. In the previous setup, since everything was in one server, if I restarted the key clock server, then when the user refreshed the page, they'd have to re-log in again because the cache was wiped out. Now, in this architecture, we can see both caches communicate to each other using the J, uh, the J groups cluster. So we have the local cache communicating with the local cache using J groups and the same thing with the remote cache. So this is a key cloak requirement. So key cloak has certain functionality that is stored in the local cache and has certain functionality that you can store in the remote or distributed cache. So that's why we have uh, the local cache still embedded here, but then the remote cache, which is also quite beneficial for key cloak has been extracted from the key cloak server and it's now running in its own JVM. So let's see how we can achieve this architecture. Here you're looking at my Docker Compose and I'm just going to scroll down and explain everything. So here we have a service called Keycloak Demo and this is responsible for creating an instance of Keycloak, just one node or one container. And then you have another Keycloak Demo container here called Keycloak Demo 2 and this will create the other container. Now these containers are the ones that will be receiving requests from the Nginx reverse proxy. So I scroll down, I have this Postgres Keycloak demo service, and this will create a Postgres container that is going to be the backing database for these two containers that we have here, the Keycloak containers. Next, I have my Keycloak Nginx service, which is going to create an Nginx reverse proxy that is going to feed requests to these two Keycloak containers. And then I also have a Keycloak JGroups Postgres service. And this is responsible for creating um, a JGroups Postgres database that is going to be used for discovering nodes in the JGroups cluster. Remember in the previous section, I'd shown how the nodes communicate with each other. And for them to discover each other, they need a way of doing that. And in this method, I'm going to use a Postgres database to be able to discover the nodes and here I just, I just have the volume defined and then here I have the network defined as well. All right, now let's look at the InfiniSpan configuration. So this is what makes a difference between the embedded architecture and the client server architecture. So here we're defining two InfiniSpan containers, which are going to serve as two InfiniSpan servers and they have the same configuration. So here we're pulling from the InfiniSpan image and we're using version 14.0. Here we have the username and password. And just as a reminder, do not put your credentials in a Docker Compose file. Put this in a secret manager somewhere. I just did this for the demo. Here have the port defined. So this external port, external port. 
uh, external port and internal port, sorry. And then we have the volumes here. So here we're pulling from this InfiniSpan XML and putting it in the Docker containers, InfiniSpan XML, and this XML is here, and we'll go over this later. But then in, in addition to that, we have some JAR files that we're including. Now, the reason we're including this JAR file is because notice that here we're pulling from InfiniSpan, right, up here. And InfiniSpan has no idea about key cloak, Postgres, et cetera. But note that from our key cloak server that we defined earlier, we'll be sending payloads or requests to this server. And so this server has to have some type of knowledge about what it's receiving. Otherwise, it's going to throw um, exceptions because it doesn't recognize what it's receiving because it's receiving things from a key cloak server, but it has no dependencies for that. So that's why we added these jars or Postgres jar here, and then also key cloak jars as well. Now we have this InfiniSpan demo two uh, container or service, which is the same as the previous one. And then here we have the JGroups Postgres, again, similar to the previous key cloak um, Postgres JGroups. It's just a way to discover these nodes. This is how the nodes are going to discover each other in JGroups, and they're going to use a, a Postgres database. Again, this is all on the same uh, network as before. So they're all running on the same network. Here we now have the configurations for the InfiniSpan cluster. It's an XML file. And at the top, we have this JGroups element. And here I'm using JDBC ping for node discovery. And what that means is that all the nodes in the InfiniSpan cluster write the IP addresses to this shared database. And when a new node joins a cluster, it checks in this database to find out uh, which other nodes are in the cluster. And then if a node leaves the cluster, it deletes its IP address from this database. So that's how the cluster stays up to date. Next here, we have the cache configurations in the cache container element. And here we're only concerned with the distributed cache because our key cloak configuration, which is a client, this is a client key cloak, is going to be sending um, its data to the distributed cache. And this is what is remote. So one to configure on the key cloak side, we'll configure it, but then also in the in finish one site, they want to configure the distributed caches that KeyCloak is going to be using. So here you have uh, the ones that are defined by uh, default by KeyCloak, which are sessions, authentication sessions, client sessions, offline sessions, offline client sessions, login failures, and action tokens. So these are the caches that KeyCloak is going to use to store data from the client. In the server element, we have some configs that allow InfiniSpan to receive client requests. So the interfaces and socket bindings essentially just expose the InfiniSpan server and enable it to accept client requests. Now here, the default is 127001 if this system property is not defined. In my case, I did not define system properties, so it's going to use the default of 127. And socket binding is the same. We have the default here, which is 11222 for InfiniSpan. And then for Memcache, it's 11221. We are using InfiniSpan, so it's going to listen on uh, this address and at this port. The security element is responsible for configuring authentication and authorization settings for the InfiniSpan cluster. So here we have a security realms element and inside it, you have some properties and we have two files. We have the user properties file and group properties file. The user properties file contains InfiniSpan user credentials. So it's a username password and the passwords can be pre-digested with digest authentication mechanisms. The groups properties file associates users with roles and permissions. So if I go into my InfiniSpan server, which is running in Docker, and look for these files, here I have the users uh, users.properties file, and you can see on the left, my username, and on the right, the digested password. And if I do the same for groups, I'll see the credentials in there as well. So here I have the user, and this is the permissions they have, the, the user is, name is admin and the permissions they have is admin because that's the only user I have currently. The other thing I wanted to mention was that the, the credentials for InfiniSpan are defined here in the InfiniSpan uh, Docker Compose admin and password. Also, in all of my distributed cache requests from the KeyCloak server, remember KeyCloak is a client to the InfiniSpan cluster. So in all of those requests for the, to the distributed cache, I also define that security authentication so I have the user, uh, username admin, password here, and the realm is default. And also note I'm using digest, which is what was being used in the properties file that I just showed you. So just wanted to point that out. And that's how the authentication is going to happen when KeyCloak sends a request to the cache. It's going to use this authentication and this authentication was defined 
here. And finally, we have the endpoints configuration here, which configures the InfiniSpan endpoints to use socket bindings and the security realms. So in this case, the socket binding we want to use is default. And if you come back up here, we see our socket binding is default. And this is using the default interface of public, which is what you defined here. So our endpoints are going to bind to these two. So the, the interfaces, it will bind to this. And to the port, it will bind to 11222. And then for the security realm, we're using default, which in this case is what you defined up here. So any request coming in will have to be, to be authenticated according to what we have set in these two files. Now that we're done reviewing our InfiniSpan cluster configuration, as well as our Keycloak cluster configuration, let's see what this looks like in action. So I'm going to log into the InfiniSpan admin console in my browser, just to show you what it looks like behind the scenes. Before I do that, I'm going to show you what port I'm going to use. So I'm running InfiniSpan uh, behind an Nginx reverse proxy. So I have HTTPS enabled, so it's going to be running on this port. So I'm going to log in on that port and I already have these two running. So I already have my Keycloak cluster running and my Nginx cluster running. I have some helper scripts here so for InfiniSpan. I ran this first for it to get up and running. And then when I was done with that, I ran the Keycloak one, which is this. I'm not, I'm not going to run them again because they're already running. Um, but when I ran those, now they're both up and running. So if I come to the browser, and go to my InfiniSpan admin console. So I can see um, it's up and running, which is good. When I open the console, I'm going to type in the password, uh, username and password, which I set in my Docker Compose. So it's admin and password, login. And I can see details about my InfiniSpan cluster. So these are the distributed caches that I had configured in my InfiniSpan.xml. And they're here and you can click into them and see what values are there. Nothing here. Authentication, nothing there. Client sessions, nothing there, et cetera. So also have global statistics here. You can see what the cluster di distribution looks like, cluster wide statistics, et cetera. So you can come in here and once we start accessing Keycloak, we'll see some of these metrics here changing. So right now I'm not accessing Keycloak. So all of these are, are zero. And once you start accessing and data starts get stored, starts getting stored in InfiniSpan, then we should see this changing. Cluster membership, indeed, I do have two clusters. I mean, two are uh, nodes running in the cluster, and these are my Docker containers. Then about it just data about this version of Infini InfiniSpan, which is 14. Okay, now let me log into Keycloak. So I'm going to log into the admin console, admin, admin, I'm in. So let's look at some of our caches in InfiniSpan. So let me go to my client sessions and I see that I have data cached here for a client because I've logged in using the UI client for, uh, for Keycloak, which is Safari. Now, if I log into Firefox, I should expect to see another client session in here. So let's try that. So same thing, just log in with my same credentials, same account. Okay, so I logged in in Firefox. Let's go back to our, our InfiniSpan admin console, uh, is there a refresh here? Yeah, let's refresh. Boom, we have another session here, it's been cached. All right, if I log into Chrome, I should I should expect to see another entry here because I'm using a, a different client, um, a different Keycloak UI client. So let's do that as well. I will log in, let's see here. Oh, let me just move this here so it's visible on the screen. Admin, same same credentials. So I'm in. If I go back to InfiniSpan, refresh, I have another session here. Now let's go back here and see what, what other caches or what other data can be stored. So authentication session, I expect here to have one session because I'm logging into the same account. So I'm using the same login. I'm not logging to multiple accounts. So if I come here, as you can see, there's only one session that has been cached in here. So that's accurate. So from here, we can see that 
our caches are working. And remember, this InfiniSpan cluster is independent. It's not embedded in Keycloak. It's running as a server on its own. So it has two nodes, and these are independent from Keycloak, which is running on a different server. And so Keycloak is sending requests to this server to save or cache data, and that's what makes this powerful. Now, the other thing I wanted to show was that if I restart the Keycloak servers, if I do a refresh on here, I should not be logged out because the sessions are not local to the Keycloak server, they're remote. So if I do a refresh, you should just be able to fetch those same sessions from here and I should be able to go about my business without logging in. So let's, let's try that and see. So if I come back here, I'm in my uh, Keycloak folder and I'm just going to restart the Keycloak servers. Let's give it time. All right, let's verify here. Looks like Keycloak is running. Let's go back to the browser. I'm going to refresh this. Oh, it's still uh, starting up, so I'll give it some time. So the containers might have a status of running, but they're still bootstrapping. So I'll give it a bit more time and yep. No login required because the cache, uh, the session is cached in a separate server. So I just refresh that. I'm good. If I try that with a uh, Chrome, let's see, should have the same result. Yep. Good. And lastly, Firefox refresh. Good. If we now go back to our global statistics, which gives us a high level overview of the InfiniSpan cluster we can see that the data access statistics have changed. Initially, when we had it interacted with Keycloak, remember these were all zero, but now that we've been interacting with Keycloak in various browsers, we can see that we have uh, some hits here, some misses, some stores, etc. So this just shows us that our setup is working as it should. Yeah, so just to reiterate, in the previous setup where the cache was embedded on the Keycloak server, the moment you restart the Keycloak server, then if you came here to refresh, you'd be logged out, which can be a bad user experience for your users because if you're making changes that are not related to Keycloak itself, in this case, caching, then they have to keep logging in. But now that you have it in a separate uh, cluster, it enables us to have this uh, functionality where you can just have um, work on the InfiniSpan cluster on its own and cache, caching changes on, on, on their own independently, and then mm -hmm all the Keycloak uh, features and changes can be done on the Keycloak server. So this is a step up from the previous setup that we had.